Anamorphic lenses were originally designed for the film world to maximize the use of the surface area available in film. But in the digital world, that's no longer the case. What's useful with an anamorphic lens is the aesthetic the anamorphic lens brings to the image, which helps immerses the audience in the picture they're watching, and also creates an organic roll-off that gives the lens a less sterile environment. I would like to show you some trailers that showcase the aesthetic qualities of anamorphic lenses and some of the modifications required to make these anamorphic lenses deliver a look that's unique. Our first example will be Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. In this show, the cinematographer and director requested that the flares match the palette of their uniforms or costumes. In order to achieve this, we had to do a certain customization of coatings and lens choices to give a lens that has unique flares, but at the same time retain the organic quality that's associated with the C-series anamorphic lenses. The flares have a certain characteristic, yet there's a certain roll-off to the lens that's neither too harsh or too soft. Notice the depth cues, being the disproportionate magnification. This helps give the illusion of depth, something that you won't get with Super 35. In the next clip, we're going to examine Star Wars The Force Awakens. In this movie, the director and cinematographer wanted us to deliver a C-series lens that was reminiscent of the 1970s period, but at the same time create an organic roll-off with a higher bit of contrast to reflect a lens that can hold up to modern shooting situations. The C-series lenses are going to be used to describe the good guys, where the sharper primo-anamorphics will be used to describe the bad guys. In the next clip, we'll be examining Suicide Squad. This is an excellent example of a stock G-series lens. The cinematographer originally looked at a spherical alternative to shooting this movie, but it felt anamorphic was an excellent way to convey a superhero movie. You'll notice a lot of the anamorphic artifacts, the flares, the disproportionate magnification, the elliptical bouquet, which are effectively used by the director and cinematographer to focus the audience into what is intended to be looked at. You'll notice that the impressionistic bouquets in the background are very beautiful and kind of create a dimension that you don't see with a spherical lens. This is an excellent example of anamorphic photography. It gives you an impressionistic look that sets itself apart from its spherical counterpart. Our next example is the movie Chef. This movie used modified C-series, which by the request of the cinematographer were delivered to provide more contrast, but have the same soft organic quality associated with the classic C-series. This is an important example because this proves that a C-series or any anamorphic lens is not reserved for big blockbuster movies that have elaborate sets. In fact, the anamorphic lenses help bring the intimacy of the characters in this drama. You notice the effective use of focus racks to help draw attention to the audience. You'll notice very beautiful bo elliptical bouquets which make things look very impressionistic and beautiful. This played very well when trying to photograph food because the food had less of a flat quality and a nice organic roll-off which made it look very palatable. The effective use of the artistic impressionistic bouquet made for very beautiful backgrounds which kind of gave the drama a lot of character and emotion. By utilizing the natural organic softness of the C-series, we get kind of a pastel texture that cannot be picked up with a modern day spherical lens or a modern day sensor by itself. The anamorphic is very effective in making a drama look very good, contrary to belief that anamorphic in large format is reserved for blockbuster features. Our next example is The Equalizer. This movie is an excellent example of the marriage of an anamorphic lens and a digital sensor. In this case, they're using anamorphic photography very effectively to create depth cues with the disproportionate magnification and the softness without using all the artifacts such as flares and heavy focus racks that had hallmarked in some of the previous examples. This shows that anamorphic can be used without having to have flares associated with everything or being overly anamorphic, but at the same time being used to break down the image to give a very artistic quality to it. Unlike our other examples, True Detective was not intended for theatrical release. Instead, this is a television show that took advantage of the characteristics anamorphic lens has to offer. True Detective was used with some of our vintage B-series lenses, which have very notable anamorphic effects, such as enhanced flares and very strong bouquets. You'll notice that the bouquets and the flares are very prevalent, which gives this TV show a very unique characteristic 
especially in a world where most television shows are shot flat with spherical lenses. The effective use of disproportionate breathing, the flares, the magnification give this show a very unique characteristic. Spectre is a unique example of a multi-format shooting situation in which both digital and film is used, as well as anamorphic and spherical are combined. In the case of Spectre, a large part of the show was shot in C-series anamorphic lenses that were modified, and the chase sequence was shot in a large format spherical. What this did is create kind of a line between heightened reality during the chase scene versus a very artistic painterly look during the bulk of the movie with the film anamorphic. This is a trend we see where the director or cinematographer wants to create different looks to tell different parts of the story. Haze is the use of using atmosphere or smoke to create distance between your front object and your back object. You can see in this type of Chinese picture that the fisherman in the foreground is very sharp relative to the mountains in the background. Automatically our brain makes the assumption therefore the mountains in the background must be further away. This gives the illusion of depth. Now how can that be used effectively in real life? In this movie here, Painted Veil, you'll notice that the mountains in the foreground are much easier to see than the mountains in the background. This is an effective tool of haze. For instance, if you're ever in an environment where there's a lot of smog, something that you see with smog appears to be very far away. But when the day is a clear day, if the winds blow the smog away, those distant objects appear to look a lot closer. A very close relative of haze is depth of field out of focus. And we're going to see here in the movie Babel, what the cinematographer used is its second cousin of Hayes of having shallow depth of field to create the illusion of layers or depth. In this case, he used the very shallow depth of field of an anamorphic lens to create an illusion of isolation because in this scene, this girl is supposed to be deaf. The cinematographer chose to use a lens with very shallow depth of field and the anamorphic out-of-focus bouquet to include an even stronger type of out-of-focus cue. And what this does is supposedly portray that she is deaf and she lives in a very isolated world. Stereopsis is probably our most dominant depth cue that we have. Basically what that means is we have two eyes that see two different images. We superposition those objects on top of each other and form a three-dimensional image. Very similar to how we see 3D movies. As you can see by this diagram, the left eye is seeing the objects in one pattern. The right eye will see in a different pattern. The brain interpolates these two images, stacks them on top of each other, and creates a three-dimensional image. We've seen this before in 3D movies with anaglyphs, where we have the right eye and left eye seeing two different images. When we put proper glasses on, the two images are imposed on each other and give the illusion of three-dimensional imagery. The challenge with this is not every movie is shot with 3D glasses or an anaglyph type technology. So we must use the other five depth cues to cancel out the fact that stereopsis does not exist and give the illusion of depth. Shading is a very effective tool. By cueing our brain where light sources are and creating kind of a nice shadowing effect, we have the illusion of depth. This can easily be seen by looking at the circle on the left. By adding just a few shadows in a light source, it gives the illusion that it's now a ball or a sphere. This type of shading is very important because this helps enhance the depth markers inside a face. We know by creating a light source and creating descending shadows that there must be depth to a face so it looks more three-dimensional. Here we see the lady where we actually have a softer lens. The shading is transitioning the depth between her nose into her hair. So what it does is gives it a more three-dimensional quality. And in the background, the shading is a very transition. It's not a very sharp out of focus, which gives the illusion of more depth. So this has something that lensing can do by using a lens with a little bit of spherical aberration or an anamorphic lens that's a little bit softer, we actually create the shading effect. Now when compared to a lens that does not take advantage of the shading effects, what we tend to do is get an image that looks a little bit flat and less dimension to it. If we look at the subject on the left, we have a very sharp lens without much shading because there's not a lot of spherical aberration. When you look at the image on the right, where you have a lens with a little bit more aberration, you have a little bit more personality, a little bit more depth to it, where the image on the left looks kind of flat and sterile. Perspective is the illusion or depth cue that the foreground is going to be larger than the background. In the illusion that we see, we see two pencils, one in the foreground, one in the background, connected by some converging lines which represents depth. Obviously, by looking at it, the pencil in the background must be larger than the pencil in the foreground. But in reality, both pencils are identical in size. How is that? Because the perspective depth cue is so strong by the descending lines, 
uh, in the converging lines of the illusion, our mind automatically believes that the pencil in the background is much further away, but in order for it to have that scale to the lines, it must be much larger. This is how this type of depth kit can be used very effectively to create the illusion of depth or an illusion of something that's really not there. The movie Citizen Kane has an excellent example of the use of the depth cue perspective. In this example, there's two gentlemen talking in the foreground. In the background, there's wood paneling beneath the window. If you look at it, everything looks scalable and looks like a normal window and wood paneling. But in reality, because of the use of perspective cue, magnification of lenses, what we see is really not what it is. You're gonna see a gentleman walk into the background, and as he goes closer to the window, you notice that the scale of the window and the wood paneling is completely different than you originally had suspected. That's because we made very strong assumptions because of the perspective cues that this window must not be as large as it is in reality. This is a very effective tool that can be used in the opposite to create the illusion that a room might be bigger or smaller than it really is. Occlusion is perhaps the most dominant of all the depth cues we've spoken of other than stereopsis. And this is the depth cue that our eyes rely the most on in creating the impression that something is three-dimensional even though it's not. What we have here is a simple cutout of a dinosaur that looks like it's going to be following you. What here your eyes are turned off assuming that the nose must be in front of the eyes and the hands must be behind the face because that's how things logically stand out in real life. But in reality when you watch the dinosaur you'll see that it's not what it really appears to be. It's actually an inverted cutout. But because we are so trained in occlusion such a dominant depth marker, our eyes are actually forced to believe it's something that's not. We're going to look at the movie Inception. He's using steps as a very strong occlusion cue. You notice here, it looks like the steps go on forever, very similar to how maybe an Escher painting would be. By using occlusion and creating a nice perspective line between the top stair and the bottom stair, you notice these stairs are not actually what you see. We actually thought, because of the way it's sized up and the fact that one stair must be in front of the other, it must logically be a continuous staircase. And it's used clearly to help to create the illusion of depth. This can be seen with using longer magnification lenses to enhance the compression of depth of field. Automatically, eyes believe it must be further away from something than it really is. So that's why when you use a lens that's maybe too wide angle, the things are proportionally too far away and it does not look natural to us. Relative motion is one of the most effective tools in the motion picture community to create the illusion of enhanced depth or more depth than it's really there. And that is because if an object in the foreground and an object in the background move at different speeds, our brain automatically assumes that they must be on different planes. The movie Braveheart is an excellent example of relative motion. In this scene, we see a mountain in the background, a cliff in the foreground, and a main subject in the midground. In its static form, it looks very plain and it has very little dimension to it. Once we add motion to this scene, it pops and has motion and detail and depth to it. It becomes a very dynamic scene. Once we pause, it becomes flat again because there's no relative motion between the foreground and the background. We're going to induce motion again. You'll see all of a sudden the scene that was once very flat has enhanced virtual look to it. Up to this point, we've really been discussing formats that have been province of the 35 millimeter format. What has been happening, though, is a migration to larger format sensors and film formats. A lot of the great aesthetic features that are seen in large format are very similar to the features that we discussed with anamorphic photography. We have greater magnification, a more natural perspective, and due to the evolution of large format lenses, large format can tolerate a softer lens. Because of the softer lens, we can introduce more spheric collaboration and evoke more of the depth cues, such as shading or compressed depth of field. So what we're going to do now is discuss some of the large formats and the lens variations that go with it. First we're going to give you an example of the difference between a large format feature and one that's shot in a smaller two perf format which is called technoscope. On the top we have VistaVision which is eight perforations of film and the bottom is technoscope which is two perforations of film. So obviously the two perforations constitutes a much smaller area of film negative versus the VistaVision. Because of the larger nature of the Vista Vision, we're going to be using a longer focal length lens with more magnification. We have more detail in the scene. What that does is creates a greater depth of field flaw, more noticeable depth cues, and a much more realistic sense of the scene versus the smaller, wider angle technoscope, which has one less magnification. You see more grain 
And because you're using a wider angle lens to get the same field of view, your perspective distortions tend to be accentuated and sometimes look unrealistic. Such as the horse, when it moves, you'll notice it only takes four or five steps to go across what seems like miles. Where in the vista vision, your perspective is more natural. So you can see here, one, very similar type of instances at Monument Valley in Utah. But you see how the horse in the bottom descends or disappears very quickly because the magnification is so exaggerated. Whereas in the vista vision, it's a more realistic fall off. What we're going to do is show you a demonstration of the difference between film and digital. Because up to this point, we've noticed that there's two very strong ways of shooting. We have the traditional film, which seems to be making a resurgence, and also the inevitable migration to digital because it's the more familiar product. Here we're using the same type of focal length lens, the same type of scenery, but you'll notice with the film, you have kind of a glow around the lights, which is part of the nature of the chemical makeup of the film. You'll notice a softer structure between the lines between the human being. This is what a lot of people call the organic look of film, which oddly enough, many digital cameras are compared, this looks the most film-like. Now we're gonna go to a digital with the same focal length lens, the same type of position, but notice the background of the lights have different. We're not getting the glow from the anti-halation layer of the film. We get a more literal sense of a black and white contrast. There's not a good strong transition between the subject matter and the background, which some people interpret as being sterile or flat. In that case, a lot of people are using lens selections to enhance those characteristics or degrade them to make it look more natural. One alternative is using anamorphic. Anamorphic has greater magnification, different depth of field fall off, and a more organic fall off to it due to the fact the lens might not be as sharp. If you look at the anamorphic examples, we'll see a little bit of astigmatism in the background. The out of focus is a little bit more abrupt. Because it is on film, we get that kind of glow around the light sources. The lines between the subject matter and the background are a little bit softer. It has a very unique look. Compared to the same type of photograph, shot with a digital camera with the same type of lens, you notice that the light backgrounds are a little bit harsher. There's not a color ring around it. The contrast between the subject and the background is much more distinct, which reduces some of the depth markers. Here's a top and bottom comparison so you can see yourself between spherical digital and anamorphic digital. Just the difference between using two different types of lenses on the same type of format give you a complete different feeling. You can see the background has a more exaggerated out of focus in the anamorphic than does the spherical. There seems to be a shallower depth of field, which kind of emphasizes the fact that there's dimension to this set. And it's not just a flat cutout. The next step is the migration to large format. What we've been talking about so far with anamorphic, increased magnification, more natural perspective. This is something that's shared with large format. Because you're using an imager size approximately twice the size as a Super 35 sensor, we're going to use a focal length twice as long to get the same field of view. Consequently, we're going to get half the depth of field as we would have seen in our Super 35 version of the same type of scene. Plus, the evolution of softer lenses being used on digital gives you a very unique look, what helps break down the story and gives the artist or the cinematographer different tools to tell a story. The out-of-focus looks very similar to the anamorphic in that it's very compressed. The lenses here are a little bit softer than we normally would use for 35 and that the transition between the foreground and the background is a much natural organic roll off. Plus, since we're seeing more information left and right with the higher magnification, our fall off depth wise is more natural. Now here's a comparison. On the top, we have anamorphic film. In the middle, we have anamorphic digital. And then on the bottom, we have large format. And you can see all three of them have very different characteristics, even though all three have very similar magnification because anamorphic and large format have the similar magnification, the perspective, the roll off, the way the depth of field carries are all unique. And all these can be used very effectively by a cinematographer or director to tell very different stories. In the case of the 65, which is kind of the new kid on the block, this is a new channel that's been opened up because no matter how you slice, dice, or cut up 35, you cannot repeat the look that you're gonna get with 65 because the enlarged negative size and the evolution and variety of lenses that come with large format. What we're going to see now are some examples of large format photography. And we're going to start from film and work our way up to digital. What's unique about large format is one is you have the enlarged negative size or imager, which you get the enhanced magnification perspective. Now, if you wed that to the characteristics that are used with anamorphic photography, we pretty much get the best of both worlds. Something that a viewing audience hasn't seen since the 1960s. So here's this clip from the Hateful Eight film test. Notice the really randomized flares. Plus, you're also getting the magnification gains. This is a 35 millimeter lens, 
Had this been a Super 35, you'd be using something like a 14 millimeter. A 14 millimeter, the mountains wouldn't even be visible because they're too small. The perspective of the river and the magnification would not look realistic. This is one of the benefits of using large format wed to an anamorphic lens. You have complete control of the depth. Remember, this is a very wide panorama. In a 35 millimeter scene, everything would be in focus. But in the 70 millimeter version of this, we have control of the foreground and the background is noticed without a focus. This accentuates the degree of depth that's in the scene. And then when you have the flares, it actually causes the audience to pay attention to what's there. And you can see now we have the anamorphic flares which add color to parts of the frame that are relatively blank. We have greater magnification. We get the disproportionate breathing. We get the really nice bouquets, which are elliptical, which almost give it an impressionistic look to the background. We're retaining the same type of magnification and clarity in the foreground. As the rack was focused, we see a disproportionate breath, vertically biased, which helps gather your attention and reorientates the audience. Here's a spherical version on a large format sensor. You notice we have lots of magnification and clarity. The focus rack there was very symmetrical. It almost looked like a zooming action. So now we're looking at the anamorphic. You see the contrast? Our out of focus is almost impressionistic. There's a vertical and horizontal fall off to it. Now we're gonna look at some leaves. When you see the rack and the focus, the leaves register a nice roundness to it. When you rack focus, they go in and out with a slight breathing effect. Take note at the focus rack and how the leaves fall off disproportionately and almost have an impressionistic look to it. The last few years have been a very exciting time for the motion picture community. This is largely due to the introduction of larger diagonal digital imagers that range from the 28 millimeter diagonal all the way up to the 65 millimeter format diagonal. There's been a pretty recent resurgence of using photo emulsion as the primary source of capturing images. And this ranges from the 35 format all the way up to the 65 millimeter format. Despite all these changes and great innovations, there's still one common core to all of this, which we call the artist cinematography. And this is largely due to the variety of lenses and the looks that these types of lenses can offer the cinematographer and the director. Oddly enough, there's one type of lens that still stands out and has passed the test of time. And this is anamorphic lenses. The type of photography that anamorphic lenses produce is very unique, especially when compared to its spherical counterparts. But what defines an anamorphic lens? Well, that's something that can be really broken down into five basic pillars. The unique construction of anamorphic lenses lends itself to a very unusual breathing characteristic that's unlike any type of spherical lens. This is largely due to the fact that an anamorphic lens is composed of two different powers, the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. So for instance, in a 50 millimeter lens, you have the magnification of a 50 millimeter and the width of a 25 millimeter. Because they're not the same, when you rack focus, you don't get the traditional symmetrical out of focus cues or the roundness that's associated with spherical lensing. What you do get is you get a nice disproportionate vertical defocus. So in this case, when as the focus is racked, the vertical building compresses, but only in a vertical position without any horizontal growth. The windshield elongates vertically. This creates a motion that our eyes are directed toward and without giving the effect that we're using a zooming action, which in contemporary spherical lensing, a breathing effect is sometimes considered a nuisance. So let's look at a spherical companion to that. We have a foreground and a background very similar to the anamorphic example. Yet when we rack focus, you'll notice that the vertical and horizontal grow at an equal pace. So it looks almost as if we're doing a zooming action. Since we have the same amount of power in both horizontal and vertical, it's not as interesting or as dramatic as the anamorphic had been. So when I rack focus the spherical, you notice that both positions, X and Y, or horizontal and vertical, grow in and out of focus at the same rate, but it doesn't have the same impact as the anamorphic, where it's all vertical and no horizontal growth. So let's review the two again. We have the anamorphic on the top, the spherical on the bottom. Please note on the anamorphic, again, the vertical is going to go out distinctly in a vertical motion and creates a very interesting movement that our vision is attracted to. Whereas in the spherical, it almost looks like a growth, like a breathing or a movement of the camera, which can be almost kind of disconcerting. We'll look at the vertical of the anamorphic. At the same time, if you look at the spherical, it looks almost like a movement 
This is a very interesting facet that's unique only to anamorphic photography because of the two different powers. And this offers a very strong tool to the cinematographer because he can use it to direct attention or he can use it to evoke an emotion that's cueing the audience that something is about to happen. Of all the pillars we're discussing about anamorphic photography, I believe magnification and perspective are some of the most important that help define what an anamorphic lens is. An anamorphic lens has two distinct axes of magnification. Consequently, because we're using a longer focal length lens, we have a more natural perspective because we're not using such a wide angle magnification to tell the story. In this case, we're using a 35 millimeter anamorphic lens versus a 17.5 spherical lens that's in the super 35 mode taking a 2-4 extraction of the same scene. Because the 35 has more magnification, you notice that the face of our subject is larger. Notice that the pictures are out of focus more rapidly and they have a more distinct character between the out of focus from the front poster to the second poster. On the Super 35 version, we're using a wider focal length lens. We're going to have more depth of field, so things may look less believable because there's too much depth of field. The perspective lines, meaning the angle of things from distance to up front, are much greater. The angles are stronger. It doesn't look as natural. We tend to think things as having more linear orthogonal lines. If we look at the proportions of our model in the anamorphic, the proportions of the forehead to the chin are more natural. They don't look as trapezoidal, and this is actually how this guy looks. And the Super 35, you notice that the chin and the forehead are a little bit more disproportionate, almost cartoon-like. He actually almost looks like he's leaning at an angle, and that's because of the perspective distortion of the lens. When you marry these two features together, the anamorphic of magnification and perspective, it creates a picture that's more realistic to the eye. When we watch a movie subconsciously, we're not arguing with our brain saying this isn't how it looks, and we can follow the movie a little bit more closely. Because of the greater magnification perspective, it tends to help make the believability of intimacy a little bit more real. A lot of people believe that large format anamorphic is reserved for large grand views of scenery. In fact, in intimate scenes, the opposite is true. The tighter depth of field and the more natural perspective lends itself to being a more realistic, intimate scene. So as we play this scene, you'll notice, again, some of the attributes of it. We have a better depth of field transition, meaning that it's more believable because it's out of focus more rapidly and there's layers to it. Our proportions of the face are more natural and the descending lines are not as angular. A kind of a real life comparison of that is if you take a picture with your iPhone. When you take a picture of your iPhone, you get a picture of something, especially a selfie. You look at your face and you're going, wow, it just doesn't look right. My face is a little bit distorted. The objects in the background are too far. As we move on to longer and longer focal length lenses, it becomes more realistic because what we're seeing is more or less how we perceive it. And the more that it agrees how our vision sees it, it's more how we think it should look. Therefore, we think it's more realistic. Up to the point where we get into large format like 70 millimeter photography, which we think is very realistic because the lines are more orthogonal, the magnification is more natural, and the depth of field fall off follows more how our eyes see things. And remember, anamorphic photography is called poor man 70 at one time because it fills a lot of the voids that 70 millimeter photography has. So the magnification perspective is a very strong defining point of anamorphic. Flare's uh, attribute that's kind of synonymous with anamorphic photography. Generally, when we think of anamorphic lenses, we tend to think of the cool flares anamorphic lenses produce. The flares that anamorphic lenses produce are very unique, especially when compared to its spherical counterparts. The reason for the unique flares is anamorphic lenses have basically anamorphic shaped elements, and they produce flares that are not rotationally symmetric. They tend to be very biased, either vertically or horizontal. The flares that most of our viewers are used to are the blue horizontal flare, something that was seen with our C-series lenses. And this type of flare is so familiar to our audience. Most special effects houses have emulated them in CG. A lot of cartoons have gone through great pains to emulate them. And in video games, I've even seen the emulation of these type of flares. Before we go into the different types of flares that anamorphic lenses produce, let's kind of reset our clock with looking at a spherical flare. Remember, a spherical lens is using rotationally symmetric elements, or basically sections from a ball. So that means the flares coming off them are going to look just like a ball. They'd be very round, they're going to have spokes that emanate radially, and they're going to have a very predictable pattern, so something that you would see even on a consumer camera. Now let's go to the anamorphic flare. 
we're going to start off with the C-series. The C-series anamorphic lenses produce the very familiar blue line streak that you see on cartoons, video games, and many movies. And that's something that many of our viewers associate with anamorphic flares. What's unique about the C-series is they're using an older type of coating. So we get a really strong blue response with a fairly broad line. Because the coatings are as efficient, we tend to get this kind of nice veiling glare. Our pupil aberrations, or flares, tend to mimic the iris, but after the cylinder elements. So we get kind of a very unique ovalized flare shape to it. Now we're going to go to the T-series. With the T-series, with modern day coatings and different lens shapes, we basically eliminated the flare. In this case, we had to force the flares out. But we still get the flares when we need them, but you're going to notice they're not as strong or as intense. They have a slightly different color. And more importantly, the blacks remain stronger or richer for a longer period of time, meaning less veiling glare. What's unique about the T-series lenses, though, is that because you have this control of the flares, we still get all the anamorphic characteristics. You get the flares when you need them, but for the most part, you have a lens that's going to act as a very clean lens that doesn't limit ability of the anamorphic lens. Next will be the E-series. The E-series is kind of an in-between lens that was developed before the T-series. Because the layout of the E-series has more lens shapes in it, we're going to see multiple staggered flares, unlike the single flare that we saw at the C-series. But because we have a better coating in the E-series, we're going to get a more controlled veiling glare, or our black's going to stay black longer. So what are the uses of the flares? The flares can quite effectively be used in adding color or splash of color to blank spots on the canvas. It can be used as a cue. You notice when the light hits the scene, the flare shows up. When you block it, it goes away. You can use it as a cue to signal the audience something's about to happen. The flare can be used as something to signify beauty in a shot, as a glimmer, kind of like a star filter would, but with a kind of unique twist. This is very unique to anamorphic photography. So let's review the three types of anamorphic flares one more time. We have the C-series, which has a strong blue familiar line, which is a very broad line. We have the T-series, which has a very faint line, one that can be controlled and it's not as obvious. And we have the E-series, which is something in between, which gives you multi-layer flares. All of these three give you three very unique flavors. And to top that, there are even more versions of this type of lens with, for instance, the B-series, the AL-series, which all give you different types of flares. But what's unique to all these, they all can be used to characterize a scene and they can't be reproduced by its spherical counterparts. A sharp lens on a sharp imager sometimes produces an image that's too sharp. What we found with sharp imagers is sometimes a less than perfect lens produces the most aesthetically pleasing images. And that's one thing anamorphic lenses really have going for it. So let's look at an anamorphic example. Here we have a subject with some trees in the background. But you notice that the out-of-focus characteristic of that background is, is very intense. It's so much so that it's even hard to register if, what type of tree it is, or if, it, if it's a tree or a bush. This creates a really nice layer that the DP can use to focus the audience's attention to the subject matter at hand. But more importantly, look at the transition line between the face and the transition line between the background. You note that it's not a really sharp scalpel-like line. It actually almost has a blending nature to it. What this does is creates a kind of natural transition, which kind of hides the fact that many digital cameras have an edge sharpening artifact that artificially creates a hard line. And this hard line sometimes almost looks like that image has been cut out and pasted onto a two-dimensional poster. More importantly with the anamorphic lenses, because we have a longer focal length lens, our depth of field is a little bit less, and because the anamorphic lenses tend to have a little bit more spherical aberration and astigmatism and coma, we get more noticeable out-of-focus cues, meaning that the transition between our nose to our cheekbone is a noticeable change in focus. The transition from the cheekbone to the ear is a different amount of focus. And the same goes from the amount of defocus from the hair to the ear. All these add up to subconscious layering effects that our brain can recognize saying, oh, okay, even though this is a two-dimensional object, it has the same recognizable depth cues that I would see in a real live 3D object or a statue. So therefore, it must have depth to it. Something that a lot of DPs have recognized when they mention why they like anamorphic photography so much is because I like the organic roll-off. I love the natural softness. I like the way it balances between my foreground and background. In a contrasting manner, a spherical lens has a much different look than what we had just seen in the anamorphic lens. The background is not as 
distinctly out of focus, so much so we can make out the details of the leaves, we can see the branches, we can almost tell instinctively if it's a tree, a bush, or even a background poster. If we look at the transition between this, the foreground subject's cheekbone to the tree, it's a very hard line, almost to the point where it's scalpel-like, like it was cut out and pasted onto that picture. We're not really sure if that's just a poster in the background or if that's a real tree. Now, if we look at the subject's face, we see that the nose, the cheekbone, the ears, and the hair, they're all about the same degree of in focus or out of focus, depending how you see it. But because of that, it's really hard for our brain to subconsciously determine what's in front of what. We know the nose logically should be in front of the ears because that's anatomically correct. But if we had an object that's a little bit less familiar to us, we'd have a very hard time of differentiating what's in front of what or characterizing the three-dimensional quality of that subject that we would see it in real life. So let's circle back and do a comparison of both the anamorphic and spherical lenses again. If we notice the anamorphic lens, we have a much more apparent out-of-focus background because of the compressed depth of field, the elongated bouquet, and the greater magnification. In case of the spherical lens, we have more depth of field, so the tree is more in focus. We can make out what that object is. So in the case of the creativity of the cinematographer, he may use the anamorphic to hide something or to reveal something or to create a distance between the background and the foreground. So you can see the organic roll-off of the anamorphic lenses, the fact that they're not perfect, have a very strong use for the motion picture cinematographer because it creates aesthetics and characteristics that can be used very effectively to create the illusion of depth, make something look more glamorous than it really is. Bokeh is the way an image looks out of focus. And quite frankly, what's out of focus can be just as important what's in focus. A cinematographer can use the bokeh quite effectively to either hide objects, to make objects stand out, or make things look prettier than they do in life itself. Now what's very unusual about anamorphic photography is that an anamorphic lens is composed of two different power axes the non-powered axis and the powered axis. Because we have two different axes, the traditional round bouquet tends to be elliptical. So let's look at a couple of examples. Here we have an anamorphic bouquet using a C50 anamorphic lens. And at first glance, you'll see some of the characteristics associated with anamorphic bouquet. First off is the elliptical shape of the out-of-focus light sources. These are light sources from distant light subjects, probably from buildings or from street lamps. But because the anamorphic process has distorted the light sources, they don't really look that easily distinguishable. This actually creates kind of an impressionistic palette, which is a little bit dappled. It gives you kind of a mystery to what's in focus and out of focus. What's interesting, anamorphic lenses transfer the out of focus cues from the foreground to the background to a focus rack. Bouquet carries to the foreground when we do a focus rack. As we can see in this moving image, the bouquet in the background is very elliptical, has kind of a glimmer due to the magnification. As we transfer the focus, it goes to the foreground. Now the foreground is just as out of focus as the background to the point where even the distinguishing figures and features of the face are completely decomposed. When we go back, back to the background, we can see that the lights retain their kind of interesting characteristic. And then we go back to the foreground, the same transfers to the face. This is a very unique process that only anamorphic lenses can lend themselves to. Now when we go to a spherical bouquet, we have kind of a round symmetry to it because the elements within a spherical lens tend to be symmetrical. What this does is creates a bouquet that one is more predictable and very easily identifiable. So the shroud of mystery you might want to hide within that bouquet or the out of focus characteristics is lost. When we rack focus to the foreground, the same happens so much so that the out of focus cue is not as apparent or as strong as the anamorphic and the face still looks like the face. So the ability to hide the face or keep it concealed is not as effective weapon in its spherical counterpart. This is partly due to the fact that an anamorphic lens is going to use a longer base focal length lens to get the same field of view. So the depth of field is obviously more crushed. And this lends to itself to the bouquet being more dramatic. So let's do a comparison of both anamorphic and spherical bouquet. On the top, we have the anamorphic bouquet with the signature elliptical out of focus. And then on the bottom, we have the spherical with very rounded out of focus characteristics. And just at first glance, you'll notice that 
the spherical bouquet, you can still make out the shapes and possibly what is out of focus. In the anamorphic, it's much more challenging. When we transfer the focus to the foreground, you notice the foreground object becomes more apparently out of focus than the spherical. This actually adds an air of mystery to what is that subject that you're looking at. So the bouquet in the case of the anamorphic, even though it's not a textbook ground, anamorphic offers a type of bouquet that's very unique and that cannot be repeated with traditional spherical photography.